morning to everyone. Thank you for that good response. Good to see you here this morning for our worship service at Benham Baptist Church. We welcome those that join us also by way of YouTube. And we hope that every heart will be blessed in a wonderful, wonderful way. We have guests with us today, and they're seated right up here. And we may have some more back in there that I haven't talked to yet. But uh, we're just so happy to have each and every one of you. And uh, I just want you to uh, let God have his way in your heart and life. Enjoy the beautiful morning. Enjoy the music. Enjoy the sharing of God's precious word. And uh, when we leave in a little while, I hope we'll all be saying, wow, it's been good in the house of the Lord. Let's go together to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy during the week past. And we're grateful that we are so blessed today to be able to join with brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, sing together and uh, share in a message. And I trust that all will encourage the hearts of each and every one that has come this way. Thank you for our special guests that are with us. And thank you for those, Father, that join us in our digital ministry. We ask that you lead and guide in all things. That you be the glory and the honor and the praise given. We ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on,
do those seven minutes. Anyway, let's take our hymn books and turn to 370, 370 at the bottom of the page. Revive us again. This is the month of revival, so we're going to use this for our theme song for that this month. All good, all stand 370. Revive us again.
choir. Thank you, congregation. Appreciate all the good singing this morning and uh, what have we done to deserve love like the Lord has so graciously seen fit to show to each and every one of us that ties in with some of what we're going to talk about this morning coming from Luke chapter 23. If you'd like to locate that passage, Luke 23. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 44. What we have here in the context of Luke 23 is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. What a great, great story that is for all of us. And in this season of revival here in the month of October 2021, our theme is to regain all of God. And we led off with that last week, talking about how we need to regain the awe of God. Today, I want us to focus on awesome scenes of the passion of Christ. The passion is the term that we use that has to do with all of the events surrounding the crucifixion of our Savior. Obviously, in the time that we have this morning, I would not be able to cover everything. So we're going to just pick out a few things that hopefully will speak to our hearts this morning and touch us, renew us, give us renewed spiritual energy and strength as we go forward serving our Lord in these days. In verse 44, after Jesus had addressed the thief that was there on the cross, one of the thieves, there were two, <clears throat> after he had addressed the one, verse 44 says that it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now watch these next three verses. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breast and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. All of these people were in awe of what they were seeing and witnessing. The first one was the centurion. The second one talks about the people that had gathered and how they were beholding the things which were done and they just kind of smoked themselves on the breast and probably were shaking their heads and saying, I just can't believe it. I just can't believe what I've been seeing. I'm spellbound. I don't have words to describe what I'm seeing. And those that knew him, his acquaintance, and the women that followed him from Galilee, they stood afar off, back at a distance, and there they were, beholding the things that were unfolding right before their eyes, or that did unfold right before their eyes. How... I think of these people. How must they have felt as they stood in awe of the horrible scenes of Calvary and what preceded its actual occurrence there on the hill of Golgotha? Why would, why would I raise a question about that? Why would I say how must they have felt as they stood there? How would you and I have felt if we had been the ones standing there viewing the scenes 
that unfolded before their eyes. Think along this line with me. Today, we sing that familiar old song, The Old Rugged Cross, and one of the lines in that song is, I will cherish the old rugged cross. Then we pick up some words out of another hymn and we articulate them to music saying, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Then we add, as we sometimes sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross, near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. There's our word, scenes, in that song. Bring its scenes before me. Those words are beautiful and they are very, very important, of course. But the people that we're reading about here in our text might very well have said back then at the time of witnessing the crucifixion of the Lord, take these scenes from me, block them out of my mind. I don't want to see them anymore. They are too horrible. They have touched me in a way that I would have never believed possible and I don't want to think about them anymore. They could have said that, but to God be the glory, they didn't say that. To God be the glory, they thought on those scenes. They talked about those scenes. They did not forget those scenes. And they began to go forth and proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection. And that message spread around the world. And I became one who heard that message as a young boy. And if you know my Savior today, you became one who heard that message. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. We stand in awe of being loved so much. How could he love you and me so, so much. Paul himself said some very important words in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. He was one of those who wanted that message to go far, uh, for, forth, and he said, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm not a Paul. I'm just a country preacher, but I will tell you, I'm determined to know nothing among us here at Benham Baptist Church, but Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected, ascended to heaven, soon to return, and to take us home to be with him. I stand in awe of what Jesus has done for me. I hope you stand in awe. We need to stand in awe of the scenes associated with his passion. Let's think of them today as scenes of a play or a subdivision, if you will, of a bigger picture or story. Unable, as I've already said, to cover them all, but I want you to allow them, that is, those that I speak to us about, to remind us of how great God's love is for each and every one of us. We should be in awe today of the love of God as we think about Calvary. Scene number one that I bring before you is that of the last Passover being celebrated back in Luke 22. Luke 22, we have the celebration taking place of the last Passover. While the other gospel writers speak of this event, Luke says something that the others do not say. Verse 15, Luke says, As Jesus gathered when the hour was come with his twelve apostles, he said unto them, in verse 15, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
Think of those words. With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. <laughs> have those words ever captured your attention? They captured mine this week. And I began to think about them and formulate this question. Why did Jesus say that? Why did Jesus say, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you? I don't know that I can give you all of the answers to that one particular question, but I'm going to suggest an answer or two from this line of thinking. Beloved, Jesus was present in the beginning. He was present when this creation was brought into existence. Let us is the verbiage that is used in the book of Genesis. Let us make man and so on. And Jesus had been moving toward this hour from the beginning of time. From the very beginning of time. And all down through the pages of time, he had been expressing his obedience to the will of the Father to ultimately arrive at this hour. Since the fall of mankind in the garden, God had required the offering of sacrifices as a covering for sin. When Adam and Eve transgressed mm -hmm. there in the garden, God provided a covering for them. And from that day forward, down through the pages of time, God had required a sacrifice as a covering for sin. But now, as the hour is arriving, Jesus sees himself as becoming the eternal sufficient sacrifice for sin that will end all of those other offerings of sin that were only coverings, for his offering would be different. His offering would bring about the remission of sin forever and ever. In his place, as he offered himself there on the cross, fulfilling all of God the Father's expectations, demonstrating his love, in its place he now institutes before the eyes of his apostles, and they maybe are looking upon this scene with eyes wide open, saying, what does all of this mean? I am in awe of what Jesus is doing at this particular time. What is he saying unto us? And in their midst, Jesus places into action a new awesome celebration. A celebration of the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood. But I want you to notice something. When you read there in Luke, Jesus gave thanks for his body that would be broken before it was ever broken, for his blood that would be shed before it was ever shed. That's why he desired to come to this hour to fulfill the will of the Father. So he said to them, I have desired with great desire to eat this meal with you and institute this new celebration that you will be able to carry forth into the future after my body has been broken and my blood has been shed on the cross of Calvary. Today, beloved, we as a church family are blessed to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table until He comes. And every time we come to the celebration of the Lord's Table, we ought to be in absolute awe of the love and mercy that the, the, the Lord Jesus displayed for us on the cross. It ought to be the most humbling, awesome experience that we have 
ever encountered in our lives. Scene number two. The awfulness of sin is exposed. If you were in a theater and scene one just closed and the curtains closed on the institution of the Passover and then the curtains reopen, now we behold the scene of exposing the awfulness of sin. The awfulness of sin. You see, the righteous purity and perfection of Christ in this scene, when you look at Calvary, is revealed in the fact that we understand and we know from what the Bible teaches that he was hated and despised by his own, one of his own, that is. That was Judas who betrayed him. He was despised and rejected and hated by his own people. That was the Jews and the leadership of the Jews who wanted to do away with him. In this scene, we see him in Pilate's judgment hall and Pilate looking to the Jews and saying, I find no fault in him. And I will probably say that again in just a moment. What do you want me to do with him, says Pilate to the Jews. And they say, away with him, away with him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. <clears throat> That's a sad scene, isn't it? The Romans wanted to do away with him. He was so hated and so despised. They wanted to do away with him. It was all because of sin. And so, beloved, as we look at this scene, as the curtains are now rolled back to help us focus on the awfulness of sin, we find that following the meal, as they went toward the place called Gethsemane, Mark says that when they came to that place called Gethsemane, Jesus, in Mark 14, 32 and 33, began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. You see, the weight of the sin of mankind began to press upon him. That weight was becoming increasingly heavier and heavier and heavier with each moment that passed. No one knows, beloved, the weight of that sin that was imposed upon the Savior that day, except Jesus himself and God the Father who allowed it to occur. I can only imagine how awful that weight must have been. Jesus himself, the Bible says, became sore amazed. That word amazed is associated with our word awe. And here is a dark side of this picture of awe because Jesus was in awe that the weight of this sin could be so heavy. Sin is awful, beloved. It is terrible in every sense of the word. It creates a heavy load and a heavy burden. Jesus himself said, again in Mark 14, 34, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Why did he say that? He said that, my beloved, because of the weight of sin that had been placed upon him. And coming from the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, Isaiah said, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I can start over here and go around. And the sins of every single one of us was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ that day at Calvary. The sins of all in this world who would believe and receive him as their personal Savior was laid upon him there at Calvary. I see him pleading there in the Garden of Gethsemane, even before he was nailed to the cross. I see him pleading, pleading with the Father, saying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He pleaded for mercy, but no mercy came. As the agony increased, the Bible records for us in Luke 22, 43, and 44 that his sweat became as great drops of blood and he began, be, became so weakened that an angel came to strengthen him. Oh, the awe of what he was experiencing. As if those things were not enough as you look in upon this scene and it unfolds before you. He had carried with him two that or three that were a part of what we might call his inner circle. Peter, James, and John there in the garden. He had taken them a little bit further with him. And he desired for them to pray with him and to pray for him. And it must have been so disappointing to the Lord whenever he returned and found them asleep. Could you not pray and watch with me one hour, he said? That was hurtful and painful to him. He yearned for their fellowship with him in his sufferings. The psalmist David captured a little bit of what all of this was in the Psalms. Chapter 69, the 69th Psalm. And in verse 19, we find these words. The psalmist here is prophetically speaking of what Jesus would experience long, long years out there in the future. And he said... Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before me. Reproach hath broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. No word can describe the agony that was being experienced. The betrayal that seemed to be present there by these who couldn't watch with him and couldn't pray. But there was more to come in this scene as the awfulness of sin was exposed. One of his very own who had walked with him who had seen the miracles that he had done, had gone to the leadership and made a bargain with them. They had given him 30 pieces of silver to betray the Lord. And he told them, he said, the man that I kiss is the one that you take into custody. And when Jesus saw the throne coming and went forward to greet them, whom seek ye? Judas comes and plants that betrayal kiss upon the cheek of the Lord Jesus or in the forehead. I don't know which, but that must have stung and it must have burned with an awful burn. I can't imagine how it must have stung the Lord whenever he was betrayed there. From there he is taken and he is Crucified, or he is beaten and he is mocked and he is stripped of his clothing all the way through the process of leading him to the point of being crucified. The false accusations, the screams, the beatings, the shameful ridiculings that take place and the mockeries reveal the true nature of sin. In this scene, you are able to see the true, true nature of sin just as I am able to see it. All of this, my beloved, is awful. And let me tell you, it's awful in the eyes of God the Father. For God the Father hates sin. He condemns sin and he demands payment for it. And the only one who could pay the price for sin to be forgiven and taken away in the life of an individual who would receive his son as their personal savior was for Jesus to die on the cross. 
So Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, And he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What great love. Awesome love. Scene 3. The height of the divine love of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is declared. I must hurry. The genuine goodness of Jesus and the depth of his love for mankind was shown in the most difficult time of his life. It was displayed in his attitude toward his enemies. There were no sarcastic uh, uh, words. There were no screams that came at them from the Lord Jesus as he was bearing all of this agony in his body. As a matter of fact, when they nailed the nails into his hands and into his feet, and when they put the crown of thorns upon his brow and pressed it into his brow so that it would stay, all of that was excruciating in every sense of the word in terms of pain. It was horrible to look at. And yet, when the cross was placed upright and Jesus looked down upon the crowd, you know what he said? Very kindly, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Awesome, right? Awesome. It was displayed in his attitude toward his friends. He wanted friends to help him in his time. We want friends to help us in our times of difficulty in our lives. And aren't we so grateful for them? But his friends did not help. They stood afar off. They only stood by. They helped in the sense that they were there by, their, uh, by being present at the situation and at the time. But they couldn't offer any help. They couldn't get to him. They couldn't put their arm around him and show him that they loved him. He was hanging on the cross, and so he helped them. The Bible records in John 19 how he looked down upon them and spoke to them and gave them words of encouragement and even told John to think of Mary as being his own mother. And from that day forward, John took Mary into his own house and took care of her. Jesus helped them. Why? Because he loved them. They were special to him. It was displayed in his attitude towards suffering. He did not enjoy the suffering that he was experiencing, but he accepted it. The book of Hebrews tells us that he despised the shame of that cross, but he was looking on the other side to the joy and the glory that would be on the other side. Therefore, he was willing to accept the suffering that God the Father imposed upon him all because of the awfulness of sin. And as he expressed his love for fallen mankind, he faced his suffering in a way that I suggest unto us should inspire each and every one of us as well today. It was displayed in his attitude toward death. The human part of him wanted to avoid Calvary. You can bet on that. It was not because he was afraid to die, for he wasn't. He was not one bit afraid to die. But he knew the pain of death for sin. And he knew that that pain of death for sin would be a stinging pain. And therefore, he faced his suffering and his cross and his passion because he loved you and me and wanted to remove that sting of death for all of us who know him as our personal Savior. And when he cried, suspended there between heaven and earth on that cross, with his arms outstretched. And he said, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The sting of death was taken care of for every child of God right then and there. Awesome, right? Awesome. Oh, how awesome. For you see, when he did that, and when he bowed his head, he fulfilled what John said of him in chapter 13, verse number 1. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So he loves you and me. Finally, scene number four. The righteousness of Jesus is proclaimed as the curtains now open again, having closed on the scene of the crucifixion and the decoration of the great love of Jesus for mankind. We've closed those curtains and now we're opening the new curtains to take a look at the righteousness of Jesus that is proclaimed now. His purity, His perfection, and His genuine goodness are all testified of, and they have been since the day of His crucifixion. Pilate said of Him before He went to the cross, as I said a few minutes ago, I find no fault in Him. The centurion said there at the crucifixion of the Lord that we have read about in the past, Truly, this was the Son of God, so he gave a testimony of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nature and unique events declare the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. For you see, in the surroundings of Calvary and the crucifixion of the Lord, Luke records for us that there was darkness. Matthew records for us that there was an earthquake. Matthew also records for us, as does Mark and Luke, that the temple uh, experienced something that was unheard of, unthought of, and that was the splitting of the veil down the middle that hung between the people and the holies of holies. And when the people saw that, and they saw the holies of holies exposed, they probably went like that, saying, I'm not supposed to look in there. I can't see that. This is, this is awful. That temple veil was very, very important. You see, before that veil was placed there, it was woven with the finest of material. And the story is this, that before it was actually hung there in the temple to separate the holies of holies from the other court, that they hooked a, a yoke of oxen to each end of that veil. And they bid those oxen to pull against it, and they did, and they pulled, and they pulled, and they pulled. And then they would take that veil and they would hold it up and they would see if there was any way that anyone could see through it. But no one could see through it. And when they were satisfied that no one could see through it, they hung that veil there in the temple. Can you imagine the day that that thing split right down the middle when Jesus died and said, Father, it is finished and there was the holies of holies exposed? Declaring the righteousness of the Son of God that was upon the cross with the people saying, My goodness, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of this. And not only did that occur, but a resurrection occurred because Matthew records in chapter 27 that there were those who got up out of the grave and they began to walk and people saw them walking. Can't you imagine people seeing someone that's been dead for several years and saying, Where did you come from? What do you think would happen right now to all of us if someone come walking right across that hill? If I told you because your back is turned, except for me and Ramona, and I said, there comes someone out of the cemetery, what would all of you do?
God the Father declared the righteousness of the Son. And the ultimate declaration from the, uh, God the Father came three days after his crucifixion when a visit was made to the tomb. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto those who came to the tomb, saying, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? And there they stood, risen. Then they began to remember what he had said. Three days, and I'll rise again. If you destroy this temple, I will rise in three days. Their mouth fell open probably. Their eyes got so wide and said, let's go find him. Let's look for him. Let's see if we can find him. You see, God the Father declared the satisfaction, his own personal satisfaction, with the offering of his son there on Calvary. Whenever he brought him back to life again from the dead and declared the absolute righteousness of his only begotten son. Beloved, as I close, these scenes are dramatic, I know, until the curtain closes. They're dramatic scenes. The truths declared are powerful. The time invested to pause and meditate on these historical events, however, are of utmost value, I suggest, unto all of you. Once you capture the awe of the scenes of Calvary in all of their glory, you will never be the same. Once I captured these awesome scenes, my life was transformed and I've never been the same since. For you see, these scenes create eternal change in the heart of an individual. When we stand in awe of Calvary, in all its glory, I don't know about you, but there are times whenever I'm so moved in such a special way as I'm standing in awe of Calvary and in awe of how I could be so loved by the Savior loved so much that he was willing to do what he did there at the cross. Our eyes, do they not, sometimes begin to grow moist. Our throat sometimes begins to choke up with emotion. And we might have to gather our emotions up just a little bit. But when we get like that, then we can more easily understand the words that Sir Isaac Watts penned a little over 300 years ago in an old hymn that we sometimes sing. And those words go like this. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, our thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Father, thank you for your awesome love. And thank you for these awesome scenes of Calvary. I pray that you will use them to speak to the hearts 
of these precious people that are with us this morning and those who may have joined us by way of YouTube because whether here or somewhere else in a home in another state or wherever an individual might be that is hearing this message this morning Father you through your Holy Spirit can bring conviction of sin and folks can realize how greatly you love them and what you did to set them free from the awfulness of sin. Have your own way in this invitation. As I often say, to you be all the glory, the praise, and the honor given. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 